So uh, welcome everybody. Uh, today our speaker is uh, Alexander de Oliveira Jr. from Illinois University currently. Alexander will tell us something about geometric and information theoretic aspects of quantum thermodynamics. Alexandre, please say a few words instead of me because you are master <laughs> of ceremony here. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm sorry for the delay, but uh, well, I don't know what happened. My internet connection here is not working so well. Well, um, so today uh, we have Alexandri, actually is Alexandri, <laughs> sorry, Alexandri Jolivera Jr. Uh, now he is doing a PhD there in the Jagiellonian University together with um, Camille. And today he's going to talk about uh, quantum thermodynamics for us. In that seminar, we'll finish our sequence of seminars for this year. We hope to get back in January. So, Alexandri, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And the screen is yours. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm extremely happy to give this talk here. As announced, today I'm going to talk a bit about some works that I did during my PhD, mainly those that my PhD thesis was based. Those work were done in collaboration with those people from different universities. And this presentation is based on four different papers. Since they fit into the same scope, since they share the same framework, the way that I'm going to present those results are mainly divided into three uh, steps. So first of all, I roughly state the problem that I would like to discuss in this talk. Then I'm going to set the scene by introducing the main framework. And finally, I will present our results and conclude this talk with an outlook. If you have, uh, I'm any... sorry. Uh, hi, hello, everybody. This is Jarek Korbic from um, from this side. I'm I'm sorry for a bit of a of a delay, but I just finished the lecture, which was a little bit longer. But I just wanted to say um, hi to to Alexander and, and uh, all the other people. Yes, sir. <laughs> I'm here, and and uh, I'm all ears. Perfect. So as I was saying, this presentation is based on three parts. So first of all, I will roughly state the problem that I would like to discuss. Then I will set the scene by introducing the main framework. And finally, I will present our results and conclude my talk with an outlook. Since this talk is based on four different works, so I will kind of divide it into two main parts where in the first part, I will mainly talk about thermodynamic transformations beyond the thermodynamic limit under certain constraints. And the second and, and the second part of my talk, actually, it's, uh, I will briefly mention, it will be a little bit more general. It's still a bit, uh, it's still about state transformations, but not necessarily uh, to the scope of thermodynamics. And as I was saying, uh, if you have any questions or comments during the presentation, please make yourself comfortable to interrupt me at any time during this presentation. Great. So I would like to start this presentation by trying to state a general problem to define this talk. And I would like to start this presentation with this general equation, which describes a uh, general state transformation. So here we might assume that we have some quantum state and we are allowed to perform some set of operations. And basically the main question that we would like to discuss today is the following. Given this quantum state and the set of operations that we can implement, whether there exist and what are the necessary and conditions to transform a given state X into Y while we add some constraints. As we see, those constraints can be energy conservation, can be locality, but it can also be practical ones, such as memory effects, or when I look at a finite size system and I ask what are the effects of processing this finite size system under certain operations. As I said, the first part of my talk will be all about thermodynamics. And basically what we are gonna see it will be um, 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 I have a quantum system. I will allow this quantum system to interact with some thermal bath. 
and I will be beyond the thermodynamic limit, I will add some constraint and ask what are the physics, the new type of physics that we can learn out of this, and most precisely how one can describe this state transformation. So the starting point consisting of introducing some framework for those who are not familiar in quantum thermodynamics, there are several different ways of addressing this question. Today, I'm going to rely into the informa informational one. And the starting point consists of looking at a given system described by some dense operator rho, some Hamiltonian H. And as I said, I will allow the system to interact with some thermal bath. By saying I will allow, it means that we have the bath there that we can always couple the system. And the assumption here is that this bath is described by some inverse temperature beta and is prepared in a thermal Gibbs state. Well, thermodynamic transformations will be modeled by the notion of thermal operations. Thermal operations are CPTP maps that encode the laws of thermodynamics. And they are very, very general. And its generality comes from the fact that we represent this set of operations in the following way. First of all, we assume that system and BEF are uncorrelated and separate. Then we bring the BEF. We assume that they form a closed system. So they evolve under the action of this unit tree. And the only assumption that I add here is that this unit tree is energy preserving. Then since I want to understand the behavior of the system, I trace out the path. So it's very, very general. Since there are no further constraints, arbitrary correlations between system and path can take place, such as no Markovian effects. Well, although I started quite general, I'm going to reduce this generality by consider, considering the evolution of energy in coherent states. What does that mean? It means that the state under considerations are such that they commute with the Hamiltonian, so they are diagonal in the energy gain basis. So this means that they can be described by um, a vector of population. And if the state under consideration is finite and if its dimension is D, this implies that this state is completely described by a D-dimensional probability distribution. A key element in our description will be the space of state, as the physics that I am to build will be uh, built in the space of state. And then in this case, since we are dealing with probability distributions, the space of state is simply the probability simplex. Having those elements, I can finally state a fundamental question in thermodynamics, namely, given some initial state and some target state, whether there exists a thermodynamic transformation connecting them. In the language that we are introducing, whether there exists a thermal operation mapping this initial state into this target state. Before I present the, the set of necessary and condition, I would like to step back and present one result that I like a lot, which says the following. The existence of a thermal operation mapping rho into sigma where rho and sigma are initial and target state is equivalent to the existence of a stochastic matrix which preserves the Gibbs state and maps P into Q, where P and Q are those vector of populations, or if you prefer, eigenvalues of rho and sigma. And I like this result very much because we started within a very general picture discussing uh, about dense operators, evolving under CPTP maps, then I restrict my description to energy coherent states. So from dense operators, we started looking to probability distributions. And this result tells us that we can discuss state transformation up the level of stochastic matrix, which preserves the Gibbs state. Well, but then the question that I would like to ask is still unanswered, namely given two probability vectors, whether there exists a thermal process uh, between them. And very surprisingly, the existence of a stochastic matrix, which preserves the, give, the Gibbs state mapping P into Q, can be recast as a partial order relation between the initial and target distribution. 
In other words, there exists a thermal process mapping P and Q if and only if P thermomajorizes Q. For those which are familiar with the notion of thermomajorization, having my, uh, for those which are uh, familiar with the notion of majorization, have in mind that thermomajorization is just a generalization of the concept of majorization. Now, I kind of look at some majorization relative to the thermal distribution. And for those who doesn't know uh, about majorization or thermal majorization, I wanted to say that this criteria that we are seeing here is pretty simple. In order to determine whether you can transform P into Q under thermal operations, you just need to check a finite number
participation relations. I, I would like to understand it a bit better. Um, uh, what is F here? It's some sort of free energy, right? Uh, yes, it's the generalized free energy. Uh -huh. Generalized to in which, uh, in which sense? So basically, if we think that free energy is um, the average energy minus the entropy of our system, it's generalized because instead of the Gibbs entropy, I have the von Neumann entropy there. Ah, okay, 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 okay. There is a von Neumann entropy here. Yes, okay. And, actually, and what is sigma? Sigma, sigma uh, which, is simply which you call the variance fluctuation? of the free energy. Is the uh, is Got f it. Okay. squared average minus the average square? Okay. And this uh, dissipated free energy. What is that? Yes, sorry, uh, I didn't put the definitions. It's precisely the difference between the free energies of the target and the final state. Okay, and you know when you uh, when you look at the uh, fluctuation dissipation relations, like uh, uh, Crookes, for example, the mm -hmm. relation, there is always this thing that you compare your process going forward in time to the process that would go backward in time and for yeah. example you compare how much work uh, how much work can be uh, can be instructed forward versus how much work you have to invest uh, to 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 run the process backwards so is there such uh, mm -hmm. like such uh, such scheme here also that that you consider a process going forward and then backward in time and you compare them and this is how you get the, the so relations yeah so just let me make a quick comment first uh there's a difference between fluctuation dissipation relations and fluctuation relations and basically fluctuation relations are more general than fluctuation dissipation relation usually if you have a fluctuation uh, relation you can derive a fluctuation dissipation relation and then, uh, okay, having said this, for example, if you have Crookes fluctuation theorem, you can derive Jarzinski uh, equality. And if you have Jarzinski equality, you can derive a fluctuation dissipation relation, which looks very much as this expression. Ah, here. okay, okay, okay. So this is Pointing. this is a little bit okay. So it's like a uh, Jarzinski rather than than Crookes, which is more more detailed. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yes. And uh, basically, uh, yeah, it is very hard to discuss time here, right? Because basically in this framework, that big unitary that you are applying is for a given instance of time. It's like if you have the system, you bring the path, and in this time they interact and then you separate them. I know that there are constructions, there are derivations of fluctuation theorems within this approach, but our take here was just to say, like once you are processing a finite size system, what is the effect? And well, we didn't force anything, but it was quite natural to derive this expression, this fluctuation dissipation relation. But yes, just to, um, to, to, to finish. So yes, you can look at this as some sort of, it's very similar to the fluctuation dissipation relation that Jarzinski has in his paper, right? Because there he also has some sort of dissipated work which is proportional to work fluctuations. Here is a bit different because uh, you have, uh, instead of work fluctuations, you have a free energy fluctuations. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just to finish then my talk, now I promise that is very quick. As I said, I would like to go also a bit beyond this uh, thermodynamic state transformation that we have been discussing. But I will go beyond, but I will still use the same framework. And in my talk, in my whole talk, we saw these slides and the idea was like, imagine that you have this initial state and you ask whether you can transform it to this target state. Well, actually, the very interesting scenario is precisely when you cannot transform. And it's interesting because then you have to think ways of circumventing this issue. A very popular way that it was an idea which was borrowed from our neighbors, uh, neighbors from chemistry is the idea of uh, using some auxiliary system, which helps you to perform this desired transformation 
with the constraint that the state of this auxiliary system returns exactly to the same state as it started. If this is satisfied, then this is called catalytic transformation. And as I said, this idea in chemistry is used everywhere, the idea of catalytic transformation. And in physics, this be, be, uh, the, in physics, this become very much popular when people started to studying entanglement transformations under local operations and classical communication. And then after there, this idea is spread over quantum thermodynamics and many other facets of quantum physics. And nowadays, we precisely know that this framework that we have been discussing uncovered fundamental limits and revealed many properties of this catalysis here. When I say fundamental limits is when this transformation can be satisfied. When I say properties is which is the state that you have to prepare for this catalyst, what is dimension, and so on and so forth. Well, the drawback is that this framework, especially this catalytic transformation framework, is highly abstract and it's limited to special cases. For example, we saw a few slides ago that we always restrict to energy in coherent state. So this kind that allow us to make statements like this idea could be more useful, or I could retranslate this statement to can we go beyond theory and step into practical context in the sense of can I take this very nice idea of resource theory when it is dealing with catalytic transformation translated within a physical model and do something nice beyond illustrating this phenomena there? And this is precisely what we did. So um, namely, we uncover a catalytic transformation in a paradigmatic model in quantum optics, the so-called James Cummings model. So in this model, you have an atom interacting with, an, uh, with a quantized electromagnetic field in an optical cavity. And our take here was to use this atom as a catalyst and the system as our main system. One of the typical problems in quantum optics is the, gener is the generation of non-classical states of light because it's, well, it's quite expensive to do this in the lab and it's also very complicated. And what we did was to present some alternative uh, method for generating these non-classical states of light using this atom as a catalyst. For example, roughly sketching the idea is the following. We can imagine that at some time t equals zero, the state of this mode is prepared in a coherent state. So it's a classical state. And we carefully engineer the state of this atom such that I turn on some interaction, which is the Janus Cummings one. And at some time t equal tau, the state of the atom returns exactly to its initial state. But now if I look at the state of this mode, its state is non-classical according to some definition of non-classicality that you can take. And what we showed was that we are able to generate non-classicality via catalytic transformation. And what is cool is that if you just need to pay the price once, right? You just need to prepare the state of this atom, activate the non-classicality of this mode, and you can reuse the same atom to activate the non-classicality of other modes. So for example, here I bring two examples. First, uh, the, the generation of light with subpoissonian photon statistics. Here, my figure of merit is the second order coherence, which is given by this expression. And non-classicality means this function less than one. And here, basically, we cooked the process such that we started with a coherent state, so it's a classical state and it's in the threshold. He, it's second order coherence is one. So it is this red line. And then during the process, I turn on the interaction and during the process, this function increase, 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 and then um, uh, falls below one. So it is precisely when this mode is uh, non-classical. And then at time t equal 40, we stop the interaction, and now the atom is precisely as it starts, but not the mode. The mode is non-classical. And we did the same for uh, to generate light with negative Wigner function. And finally, to finish my talk, uh, we also showed that this is robust under dissipation. 
So you can also add noise uh, such as like cavity loss or atom decay, and you can still generate high levels of non-classicality in this way. Well, since I already spoke too much, I left a bit of questions here. Uh, and also together with these questions, I like to make science in a way that I make everything that I do public. So all my codes related to those projects that I discuss is available on my, on, on my GitHub. And thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much for the talk, Alexandri. That was very, very nice. Now we have time for questions from our audience. We have claps, a lot of claps. Thanks. Okay, so um, I have a question. So Alexandri, you talk about many uh, thermal process. Can you say something about the influence of uh, entanglement in your initial state in this, in yeah. this process, please? Yes, this is a very good question, actually. And this is uh, ongoing work that we are doing because basically, okay, just let me, yes, I don't know how to, okay. I brought this bar back, but I cannot minimize now. Okay, I can now, yeah. So basically here, definitely we are considering separable states. And so far, as far as I'm concerned, the same analysis was not done for when, well, when we started with some entangled states or when you ask the question, is it possible to generate some entanglement in a thermodynamic way? And as I said, this is some work in progress. I can tell you that the cool thing is that thermal operation allows you to generate even like bell states, but this is just like some spoiler, but yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, what is, uh, if I may, uh, what do you mean by uh, fully quantum states? Ah, yes. Uh, um, here on your, on your list. Mm -hmm. Uh, because here I'm considering energy incoherent states, right? States that commutes with the oops, okay. states which commutes with the Hamiltonian. So basically, uh, when I say like fully quantum states, I mean like states with with coherence, for example. Because yes, one of the main assumptions that I did here was that this state commutes with the Hamiltonian, so it's diagonal in the energy eigenbasis. And because it's diagonal, we can derive those conditions. Okay, but okay, okay, okay. Yeah. When we say full, like imagine that you have some coherent state. Can we do the uh, same for coherent state? Uh, it's, uh, I don't know if you have done anything in that direction, but it smells like a uh, awfully complicated. Yes, for, the, for a qubit case we solved, we know mm -hmm. how to construct the, their thermal cones, but it's an open problem how you can transform them for higher dimensions. Like oh, that's interesting. So then, uh, if I may just uh, briefly, can you give us some hint, like what uh, what happens for qubits? What is the um, uh, the extra thing that allowing for energy coherences brings here? Uh, that, that that's interesting. Like yes. how does it? How does it show up, this energy coherences? So basically, what it happens there you is that you have to treat the diagonal differently than you treat the coherent part. So you know what are the set of necessary... Um, you, you know the conditions to treat this coherent part, and then basically you treat them differently and put it together. Uh, but then, like, we also know that usually the diagonal part behaves differently from the non-diagonal one. So this is the main issue. And when you we go for higher dimensions, we don't know how to capture these different evolutions that this coherence has than uh, the diagonal one have. Yeah, yeah okay. But, but uh, do you have some sort of like a... Uh... Like I'm very curious in the uh, not in the procedure but in the results. Like, do you do you have some like you know, some sort of like a new effect that that happens because you you have energy uh, coherences? Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, okay, I was gonna show you a plot, but it might be that I take a bit more of time to show. But yes. So basically, one of uh, one one interesting effect is that if you look at, for example, yes, for example, this picture here we see that the past is always like connected with the future, right? And if we, oops, 
if we zoom out, we even see this light cone, de oops, sorry. We even see this light cone decomposition, like this is your state, past, future, incomparable, incomparable. But then when you have coherence, it's not all parts of the past which is connected with, with the future, which is quite interesting because I don't know why, but they are uh -huh. Uh -huh. so So something is disconnecting then, right? Something is, is disconnected, okay. yes. Okay, so okay, you okay. have a part which is connected, but you have parts of your thermal cone which is not connected. And this is highly non-trivial. This would be one of the effects that you have. And also, okay, cool. I may even like this, why they, well, they kind of, they have to be connected, I would say, by causality, but yes, but it's not so, so clear to say there's specific reasons why. But yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Very, very interesting. Thank you. And thank you for the talk once, uh, once again. Great one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yale. Do we have more questions for our audience? Well, I, I don't see any, so I think we can uh, we can finish. Uh, once again, Alexandri, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. The talk was very nice, and I hope to see you soon. Yes, definitely. Thank you for inviting. It was my first time in Warsaw <laughs> online, but yeah, very nice. Thank you. You're welcome.